you doing? Running late for curfew? What are you doing? I'm making a late night sandwich like your grandma doesn't like me to. <laughs> your secret's safe with me. Mm -hmm. Same. So how was your party? Lame. I don't get what's so special about New Year's. Oh, what's special about New Year's? Yeah, I mean, you stay up late, everyone says, Happy New Year, and then a ball drops. Let me tell you something. I remember a year uh, you were just born. It was a very difficult year. You may not believe this, but there was no toilet paper to be found anywhere. Gross. Well, that wasn't even the half of it. People couldn't shake hands, they couldn't hug. You didn't want to leave your house or you're afraid you might get sick. And masks, everyone was wearing masks everywhere. You couldn't tell if somebody was smiling or frowning. That sounds weird. You, you couldn't go visit with family. Not even at the, the holidays, you know? Then what happened? Well, that's the best part. Then God got us through it, just like he always does. That's why I like new. See, God says, behold, I'm doing a new thing. New, my dear, gives us a, a different perspective on things. Like on toilet paper, I guess. <laughs> I mean, just because it's new doesn't mean it's gonna be good. You're right, you're right. That is why we hold on to the words of Jesus, who said, uh, in this world you will have troubles. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. That boop is why we celebrate new. Hey, Grandpa. Mm -hmm. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Do you want to hand or turkey? Good morning, Advanced Church. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I wanted to start with a story for you guys. It's just something that I heard it quite a while ago, and then it came up again recently, and uh, I just wanted to share it with you guys before we get going here. So uh, I really wish I could get uh, the source. I just can't remember where this, where this came up from, but uh, it's about a gentleman. He talks about when he was young, his mother gave him a butterfly net. And so that's how he would spend hours of his day, is he would take his net and he'd run around trying to catch butterflies. Uh, I always laugh because when he's talking about the story, he's like, and I never caught one. <laughs> so all the hours that he had spent into it, he don't, he's like, I don't think I ever came away with one butterfly. So eventually that led to him putting down the net for the last time and walking away from that hobby. Uh, but he found going through life, especially now as an adult, that uh, butterflies are all around him. You know, when he's uh, a kid chasing them, they're flying away from him. He just can't seem to, can't seem to grasp it. But now he's focused in work, uh, his hobbies, his gardening, uh, playing golf with friends. And uh, just those quiet moments, he found that butterflies, rather than running away from him, would come to him. And he described the butterflies as like the idea of being content or the idea of peace in yourself, that the harder you run after it, the harder you're trying to chase it, the further and further they're going to get away from you. It's going to fly away. It's going to hide. But when you find contentment in the now, that's when it comes to you. So next I wanted to read a verse from, uh, or I guess a bunch of verses from Philippians 4. So if you want to follow along with me, I'm going to start at verse 1 and we're going to go through to verse 9. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Yodia and Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, Help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. 
Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What, have you, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So when I read through this, I really believe tr- Paul is trying to help them get priorities straight when you, when you walk through this. So the whole book of Philippians is filled with encouragement for people. At this time, I believe Paul is informed that uh, he has his sentencing in Rome. He's facing a possible execution. So this could be the end of his life. But the whole time he's writing to the Philippian church, uh, he shows optimism. He doesn't complain. He doesn't be, woe is me. But he's at peace with where his life's at. And instead uses this to show optimism and the joy that he feels in, in them, in the church, and in God. He shows him that he's content with the direction he's headed because he knows what he believes, he knows his priorities, and he knows that those will continue to be constant. Here in the fourth chapter, uh, Paul wants to leave a message of encouragement to the, to the people he's writing to. So as you walk through it, Paul starts off by saying, stand firm in your faith. So no matter what's going on in the world around us, he is facing execution by the Romans, but... He's standing firm in what he believes and will not back down. He has that confidence in what he believes, confidence in God, and refuses to allow that to be shaken. No matter what challenges they have in their lives as well, it's an encouragement to say that nothing can break our faith. Nothing can break the constant that is God and find peace in that. He also encourages them to settle feud. I was laughing. um, uh, Yodia and Syntyche, whenever I see names or cities, I always make sure that I listen to an audiobook, something that says the names so that I know how to say them. And I laughed because there was two that I listened to. And uh, the guy starts the verse, he's like, I entreat Yodia and Syntyche. I'm like, good, I'm not the only one who doesn't know how to say the words. <laughs> and then the other one I laughed at, the guy literally just said, I entreat Yoda. <laughs> but anyways... These two women are feuding. They're having a very big disagreement that's causing disruption in the church. So he writes to encourage them to to settle that feud. And what they can agree on is God. So agree on God. Agree on the, the, the constant that is God. And with that, too, he encourages others to help. You know, help people find that. Help people agree to work through their issues so that you can all work together and raise God. When we can pray and communicate with God, when we can keep him at our center, that's when his peace will fill us. And then lastly, I'm sure you've heard it before, the the whatevers. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. He encourages that these are the things we should be focusing on in our actions, our deeds, our thoughts. We should be thinking about things that are honorable, that are lovely, that are just and pure. And it helps us to keep our focus on God because God's thoughts are pure. His actions are honorable and just. So we can keep that in our minds, keep God at our center, that allows his peace to come and fill us. Now, I don't know if uh, you guys have seen the movie Soul yet from Disney, um, but that theme of content, peace, uh, it's very well, uh, or it's very evident in, the, in this movie. Now, before I get into it, spoilers ahead, needless to say, uh, but I've also learned that with movie etiquette, uh, after four days of a movie being out, spoilers are free game. But at the same time, I understand people don't want to be spoiled for some movies, so the beauty of being online right now, if you can pause me right now, go watch that movie, and then come right back to this. I'm never going to (laughs) know. But anyways, getting into it. In this movie, we're following two characters, uh, one of which uh, has been trying to spark, uh, get their spark, get their reason for living, is what they call it. So the souls, until they uh, 
until they find that spark, they're not able to go to go to Earth. And this soul is named 22. The other character is someone who's uh, just found his big shot. And uh, uh, he's trying to, trying to make his dream come true. And he's chasing this dream and has a tragic accident, unfortunately, and ends up as the mentor for this, this soul 22. Uh, so unintentionally, as this character, knowing that he has his big break, tries to get back to, to his body and uh, uh, acts unintentionally, takes 22 with him down to earth. So 22 ends up in his body and he ends up in the body of a cat. So we watch as these two start to journey together to try and make things right again. Uh, but through it, you get to see big moments of the guy's life, you get to see little moments, and you get to see someone's perspective who's never seen these things. So like having uh, food for the first time, being able to taste for the first time, uh, watching uh, those whirly seeds, those maple seeds come off the trees and spin all the way down to the ground. They get to see and experience life for the first time. And <laughs> the whole time, the guy who's trying to chase his dream, trying to, to set things right and, and get his big break is miserable the whole time. While the person who's just going through and experiencing and having, having everything new, uh, you couldn't be happier. Now, in the end, they do try to correct things and, and uh, the Soul 22, they end up finding their spark but they have no idea what did it. And I love it because the movie doesn't tell us either. It doesn't tell you what, uh, what moment from that day, whether it was big or small, was the spark for that soul. And it's just cool. It wasn't chasing anything. It wasn't, wasn't trying to capture a dream like, uh, I believe his name was Joe, I believe uh, as he was trying to fix things so that he could have his, his big shot. So what we learn from that is, uh, Although we don't know what caused the spark for 22, we can see that Joe, during his journey, the harder he tried to chase that dream, the farther it kept getting away from him. And for soul 22, you got to think about this too. How many people are on the earth, right? And soul 22, so it's been there since almost the very beginning, trying to find what that spark was. And the more and harder it chased it, it couldn't find it. It couldn't find that spark for, for life. But as soon as it let go, it could be happy. It found, found that peace of coming to earth and, and living that life, something it was afraid of. It found peace in, in being able to do that finally. And on Joe's end, the moment that uh, he thought was going to be the big break when he finally does have it, it was like, meh. Just wasn't, wasn't what they thought it was going to be. And so that was the idea with the butterflies that the harder you're chasing something, it, it keeps getting away from you. So when he finally got it, it wasn't the thing. It wasn't the thing. And that's how we end up getting trapped in a cycle where we chase something, we get it, think that that's what's going to make us happy. And it's not enough. But when they finally let go of that, that chase, let go of that dream, they were able to find peace in who they are and what they're doing. There's one character I really wanted to, uh, to talk about from this movie, and it's, uh, there's a barber named Dez. So originally, uh, Joe, uh, I think they uh, have a hair accident, and uh, they go to Dez so he can get it, uh, his hair fixed before his, his big show. Uh, and then they uh, talk a little bit about, about Dez's life. And uh, so originally, we hear that uh, Dez wanted to be a veterinarian. See, Soul 22 brings up the idea that you were born to cut hair. That's what you were always meant to do. And in his mind, he's like, this is not what I wanted to do. He's like, I was in the army, and when I got out, I wanted to become a veterinarian. So that's what he was planning to pursue. But as he gets ready to do that, uh, he finds out that his daughter's very ill. So this strong wind comes in and completely changes the course of, of what he thought his life was going to be, what his dream was to, to have. And they point out that it must suck, you know, being in a, a job that you're, you're stuck in, being unhappy with what you're doing. But that's corrects them. He's like, who said I'm not happy? 
I get to meet interesting people. I get to meet new people every day. I get to learn about new topics. I get to learn about new people, what their lives are. What do you do for work? Do you like it? Do you love it? He gets to learn all this about people. He gets to make them feel comfortable, enough to share, to talk. And he gets to make them happy, you know, with the new new look, new confidence in themselves. He shows them how beautiful they really are. So why wouldn't he love that? See, Des chose to be content with his life now. You know, I think about that. I'm like, one, not being able to chase your dream, your dream job, but also coming back from the army and then learning that your your child is sick. Not not like a cold, but like sick, sick, where they need they need medical help. And it could shake a lot of people. It could it, it could shatter a lot of a lot of spirits. But he didn't allow that to happen. Instead of complaining about the, the, the hand he was dealt, he chose to take it and make the best choices moving forward. He ixnayed the veterinarian school for a barber school, something that was a lot cheaper, a lot quicker, so that he could uh, get back out, have a job that's consistent, bringing in a consistent income, but also something that would have been so much more flexible where if his daughter had an appointment, he can make sure that he can be there for that. But as a veterinarian, or if he was still in school, it's very hard to, hard to make that time. So what he did is he tried to find the value of what he was doing. And can you imagine the value that would have had to his daughter? And then you see the value that he has to his community in that role as a barber. While they're there in the shop, they have a whole crowd of people watching them and listening to them, what they're, what they're talking about. You see the impact that he has in the community. And you see the impact that it had for himself, how happy he is doing what he does, even though he thought it was going to be so different than where he's at. You could see how at peace he was with the the life he's been dealt. And rather than chasing that thing that would have made him happy, he allowed that peace, that contentment to come to him, to be in the now. I don't think anyone knew this better than Paul. You see, Paul was respected, admired, adored by some people and feared by a lot of people uh, when he was Saul. But that changed when Christ came to him and blinded him and he went on a whole different journey from where his life was. I mean, like, you can look at this guy's stories. I mean, he was rich, he was poor, he was uh, well, uh, well fed, I guess, you know, <laughs> well off, and then poor and hungry and in jail, like he even had had the moment where he could have escaped from jail, but rather than doing that, he was content with where God had placed him, where he was in his life, and chose to use that to bless the the jailers, to keep their spirits, and to show them the miracle that is God. And then you even think uh, he was stoned. He was dragged out of a city, stoned within an inch of his life, a gets up, goes to the city to get his things, you know, I'm like, how, how at peace you must be with your, your life to be, able to, to be able to do that, to not want to escape prison to cause harm to somebody else and to people who just attacked you, that you'd walk back towards them. How at peace you'd have to be to do that. So I'm going to continue on in Philippians if you want to read with me. It's uh, verses 10 to 13. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. See, this passage is so important because Paul very clearly states that being content is not just all good things. It's very easy to be content when things are good, but we see wealthy people every day struggling to get to the next day and the next day. It's a chore. And we can also see people who are living in poverty with huge smiles on their faces. Because being content has nothing to do with the situation we're in. 
It's about us, our state of being, and what our focus is. When we have a focus on something valuable like our families and doing good deeds, helping our neighbors, our relationship with God, we're always going to be content regardless of the situation. You could be walking on a beach or walking 30 minutes to work in the snow. You're going to be content when your focus is right. It doesn't matter what situation you're in. Lastly, I love that Paul writes that he learned that secret. It is such an encouraging thing to know that that's something that can be learned and gained rather than that being some unnatural ability he was blessed with. It's just such an encouragement to know that that peace he felt knowing that um, even when he's, he's writing this, he says, not that I'm speaking of being in need, but that's the whole thing. He's in a terrible situation. But he doesn't view it that way because it's not about the situation. It's about who we are, what we do, and our relationship with God. It's about keeping those priorities set and your life feels constant. But I love that he writes that you can learn that. That every challenge we face, every blessing, we can face it the same way. And the whole chapter coming up to it is telling us how to learn it. When you think about that, stand firm. We stand firm in, in our relationship with God, our faith in God, and we can't be shaken. We uh, work out our feuds and remind ourselves that God is the center. I can disagree with you on what sports team is the best, but we agree on God, and that's what matters. You know, uh, doing good deeds and helping each other, making sure that... Uh, uh, that selfish heart, that pride doesn't sneak in. And then the verse is about the whatevers, whatever's true, noble, honorable, pure, lovely, making sure that what we think about, what we do, what we spend our time on, that it matches up with that vision. So one other thing I wanted to talk about, I'm sure you guys have heard about this before. In Arizona, there's a thing called the biosphere. Uh, essentially, there's just a big dome, and uh, scientists will use it to, to study our planet. So they kind of create like a miniature Earth, if you want. But they make the miniature Earth in there so that they can uh, study the planet in an environment that's controlled. So that they're, they're the ones in control of it. So they can dictate um, what the, the weather is, what the uh, oxygen levels are. They can, they can change all this to see how it affects our planet or how it would affect our planet. And one of the most interesting discoveries, at least to me, uh, was how tree, trees would grow in the biosphere. Uh, because of the controlled environment, uh, trees were able to grow significantly faster. There's no outside forces weighing them down uh, for nutrients, for water. Uh, it's fully supplied, so there's no no need for them to have the deep roots to, to dig and find. It's given to them. But we watch, uh, you can watch these trees grow significantly faster than trees you'd find in the wild. And the odd thing about it was that they grew so quick that they wouldn't mature. So they would hit a point where they just collapse on themselves or they'd crumble or they'd fall apart or the roots would give way and the tree would fall over. They never matured properly before they were grown. And what you thought was such a good environment wasn't. <laughs> it's, it's actually what, what, what doomed them. See, in the wild, uh, trees, they got many things that they're up against. In the ground, we talked about how uh, when they were just given everything, they never had to develop the same root system. But in the wild, we see trees grow everywhere and they got every kind of root system you can think of where some of them go a uh, big root down deep and spread out from there and we have other ones where the nutrients are close to the top so they spread out wide but we watch these trees grow anywhere you can watch them grow in the desert you can watch them grow in a forest you can see a crack in the mountains and a tree will start growing out of that because it's not about the environment it's about the tree Long story short, trees are content with the good, the bad, and the ugly. 
They take the environment that they're in and they thrive. They use the good to grow and the stresses around them to become stronger, like the wind. Trees have strong trunks because of the wind, but they're also flexible and it's weird. But the trees have to be strong so that they can hold their weight. They can find nutrients deep down and they don't fall over on themselves or the wind comes and it blows and it doesn't blow them over. But at the same time, they have to learn to be flexible because if the wind is so strong, they have to learn to be able to, to sway, to go back and forth, to not let it not let it break them, not let it shatter them. So we have no idea what tomorrow, next month, next year, we have no idea what those are going to look like. But what we do know is that God is constant. And if we're keeping him at our center, if we put our value into things that are valuable for, for God, for the people around us, and we keep that as our priority with keeping God at the center, then we can all still have peace no matter what, what our environment's going to look like. We can learn to face every situation the same way with a God-centered heart. So I just want to encourage you guys that whatever life is going to throw at us, whether it be good or bad, just keep God at your center and that will give you peace. Knowing that our relationship with him never changes. He never changes. And no matter what, he is always on guard. Let's pray. Uh, dear God, I just want to thank you for this day. I thank you for the, the constant force that you are in our lives, the uh, constant love that we can feel, and the peace that you can give us and remind us every day. I just want to pray for, for everyone here today that uh, you would... <laughs> Give them that peace as we start this new year, as we go into to unknown times and we go into to something new. I pray that you give us a peace, give us your peace in every situation we face. In your name I pray, amen. Hey, I'm Pastor Derek. And I'm Pastor Shanga. And thank you for joining us here at Advanced Church Online. It's our hope as a church to help you deepen your relationship with Christ and strengthen your faith. And we would love to connect with you. And there's a number of ways that you can do that. You can email us, you can text us, or you can comment below. And of course, you can always visit our website to get more information about us. Thanks for joining us. See you next week.